we will record the session. So please uh, mute your microphones and turn off your video cameras. It is my great pleasure today to present Luis Torgo, our speaker today. Luis graduated in informatics at the University of Minho and then obtained his PhD in computer science at the University of Port Portugal. It, 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 Luis is a Canada research, research chair on spatial temporal ocean data analytics and a professor of a computer science at Dalhousie University in Canada. He's also associate professor at the Department of Computer Science at Faculty of Sciences here at the University of Porto and an invited professor at the Stern Business School of New York University. And he has been collaborating with the Master of Science in Business Analytics since 2014. He is a member of the Institute for Big Data Analytics at the Housey and a researcher at Riyadh in Esctec. He has been doing a research in the area of data mining and machine learning since the 90s and has published over 100 papers in, in several uh, forums. Uh, his current broad research interests um, are around analyzing data from dy dynamic environments with a particular focus on time and space-time dependent data sets, and is searching for unexpected events. Okay, Luis, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And uh, the screen is yours. Okay, hi everyone. And uh, thank you, Eduardo, for the nice presentation. Although it makes me realize that I'm really old, as uh, you know, apparently I'm doing research since the 90s. So, <laughs> so <laughs> and thank you also, Paula, for uh, you know, uh, this joint invitation to, to uh, be part of this uh, seminar series, which is uh, very uh, you know, uh, uh, good for me because as a former uh, uh, member of uh, the Faculty of Economics, of course, uh, it's very special for me to be uh, here at this series. Okay, so um, so the, the idea then for today is to, to try to talk a bit of some uh, topics related with time series forecasting uh, and particularly uh, um, you know, addressing uh, some of the work that I've been doing with uh, my uh, colleagues at my research group and students uh, uh, on this area. Okay, so um, first, you know, something which is most probably very obvious for all of us is that, you know, um, time series is uh, increasing in importance in our world because, you know, we have uh, been witnessing uh, the increasing usage of uh, many types of sensors and that are collecting more and more uh, uh, information uh, about different uh, areas of uh, and domains of application from you know, uh, the seas, the you know the, the environment, you know the, our cities. You know, driving is uh, cars co are collecting data in real time nowadays, and so you know all of these are you know free or very easy to collect data that is. Uh, arriving to the cloud most of the times because most of these devices nowadays are connected to the cloud. And so this uh, has led to an increase uh, in the importance of uh, the analysis of this type of time series data, okay? So uh, maybe because of that, we have also witnesses, uh, witnessed uh, an increase on the amount of uh, available approaches to handle this type of data, okay? And so there are many research areas like econometrics, statistics, machine learning, and others that are somehow dedicating time to research on this, uh, uh, you know, analysis of time series. And of course that leads to, you know, uh, many different types of models that uh, obviously in, um, entail different types of assumptions, different pros and cons, and, and also of course, different results on the many uh, benchmarks that the community as uh, you know, uh, created. Okay, so that's more or less the context uh, of uh, why it is still very important. Although it is a very, er a very, very uh, old area, even older than my research apparently, uh, of research. But it's you know uh, some motivation for continue to study some of uh, you know uh, aspects related with this uh, with this uh, area. Okay, and so uh, in particular uh, in this talk, I would like to address 
um, three concrete questions. Of course, there are many more, and I will leave some of them in the end as a kind of, you know, uh, still other open research uh, questions with, with time series. But, you know, uh, on this talk, I would like to address uh, three particular questions. Okay, so the first of, uh, of them is, you know, um, you know, as a practitioner or as a data scientist or as an analyst, uh, uh, you know, uh, given a certain set, you may wonder with so many uh, available modeling approaches, what should I use for this concrete data set? And of course that, you know, uh, to answer that question properly, we need to think about how to evaluate and compare different alternatives on a single data set or on ser several data sets. And that's the first topic that I would like to address, okay? Then another, you know, uh, question is, you know, uh, are there, you know, families of models or models that are clearly better than others? And so uh, that, of, of course, would make our life easier because if we are aware uh, through, you know, benchmarks that, you know, some uh, type of approaches are more adequate for this type of data, that would be very nice, okay? And then, uh, you know, uh, in this context, I will discuss some of the existing benchmark results and, you know, uh, um, explain why some of them may be a bit biased, okay? And finally, given this uh, diversity of models and of the results as we are going to see, I'm going to... Uh, uh, talked about ensembles as a potentially good way or good way of answering uh, this uh, diversity of results and problems, okay? Because that, um, ensembles in a way uh, have to do with, uh, you know, diff using different types of models, somehow aggregating their opinion differently. And, you know, that may lead to, you know, a better adaptation to different uh, regimes and different types of, of problems, okay? And so that's, you know, a kind of a wrap up and uh, in a way, a natural follow-up from the uh, the previous two questions. Okay, so that's more or less the summary of the uh, and the structure of the of the talk. And so I will start with with the first question. You know, uh, which model or approach should I use for for a certain data set? Okay, and that's as I mentioned, has to do with you know um, methodologies for performance estimation uh, of uh, you know uh, of different algorithms or models in the context of time series forecasting. Okay. And, you know, the, the work I'm going to talk about is, uh, in a way, a summary of uh, a paper that we have published uh, recently on the machine learning journal. Now, why is performance estimation important? So it is, uh, you know, a crucial step on any predictive analytics, because as analysts, we should be able to deliver not only a good model, but also attached to this model uh, some form of, uh, you know, a measure of its predictive performance, which that is reliable, so that our end users or our organizations are, you know, uh, able to judge whether that is enough and uh, are able to, to, you know, to know what they can expect from these models, from these predictive models, okay? And so, moreover, this sort of, you know, uh, performance estimation uh, is also crucial in terms of uh, you know properly and correctly select the best parameter settings uh, because nowadays you know many modeling approaches are so complex that they have far too many parameters to to be set in order to uh, get the best out of them and so it's uh, for comparing all these alternative settings it's very important that we have you know a well established way of comparing and evaluating them and so finally, because of all of this that I mentioned of the existence of many different types of models, it's also very important uh, to have, you know, this sort of methodologies to, 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 to select the best model for a certain uh, data set or application, okay? Of course, best here, it's, you know, it's always going to be an approximation because, you know, we, we cannot afford to test every possible model on a, any uh, application, okay? Now, uh, Performance estimation has as main goal to use the, the data that we are given by our um, end users to obtain a reliable estimate of the performance of any model on unseen data. And the three things that I've uh, you know, uh, somehow highlighted on this, this sentence are, are very important. First of all, that we should carry out this performance estimation using what we were given, which is a data set, and then we aim at obtaining some an estimate of its uh, of a performance of a model which is reliable. And by that, I mean that there is a high probability that it will, you know, occur in the future on unseen data. And that is also very important because 
you know, um, assessing the performance of a model on the data which was already seen by the algorithm is uh, tends to be uh, unreliable because you know most of the models are, are able to overfit this data and so you know they will of course obtain uh, a very good performance on the data that they have seen so what we really want is to estimate their performance on unseen data okay now um in the context of um hello what is happening here oh. In the context of uh, time series uh, performance estimation for time series models, there are three main classes of approaches, okay? Uh, Cross-validation, out-of-sample, and frequential that I'm going to describe in the next slides. So uh, each of these groups or uh, sets of uh, approaches for obtaining uh, the estimates, uh, you know, use the available data uh, in different ways, okay? And so our question here is, you know, what is the impact of uh, um, this different way of using the available data on the quality of these estimates, okay? And so, uh, moreover, we want to, to know, uh, you know, that uh, given the properties of time series data, uh, mainly, you know, uh, more particular, the fact that observations uh, on time series are not independent because there is, you know, a time dependence between the observations and the observations sort of out of relation, then, you know, ignoring these dependencies may or may not introduce biases on the performance estimates, and so we want to check that, okay? So that's, uh, you know, that was the goal of uh, uh, our study, uh, uh, exactly to, to, to know uh, how these dependencies may impact different types of uh, performance estimation methods, okay? So let's go through, uh, you know, these uh, three main classes. So cross-validation, uh, you know, uh, is an iterative process that uses the available data in a very efficient way. So uh, that means that all the observations in these available data are used for both training and testing across the different iterations, okay? And so this efficiency, this, this data efficiency is particularly relevant for uh, small data sets where, you know, uh, uh, because the data sets are small, we, we, we should use all this data in, a, in, a, in an efficient way, okay? Now, the key potential problem is that um, the cross approach to cross validation uh, does a permutation of the data. And so the order of the observations, the time order in the case of time series, is not preserved. Okay. Now, uh, Bergmeier uh, and colleagues on a very you know, highly cited um, study has recently shown that there is no problem of applying cross validation for a stationary time series. Okay. Now, the problem is that uh, most real-world data sets, or at least uh, a large part of real-world uh, time series are non-stationary. And so uh, because of that, several variants of cross-validation have been proposed in the literature to try to overcome this potential drawback of uh, um, the standard cross-validation, okay? So standard cross-validation essentially, you know, given the available data, it starts by random, uh, randomly permuting this data, which of course will, you know, uh, um, eliminate the, the natural time order on time series and then you know this random permuted data is going to be a split in k uh, equally sized folds and then we have k iterations where one of these folds is left, is left aside as a test set and we build the model on the k uh, minus one uh, folds and then uh, test this model on the fold that was left aside obtaining one score and then we do that k times for each of the you know the k uh, folds okay and so and that you know uh, averaging this course uh, will lead us to the cross validation estimate now as i mentioned the the main problem or potential problem of this is this uh, step of randomly permuting the data and because of that as i mentioned the literature has proposed several variants of cross validation that uh, tries to you know overcome this limitation so for instance block k fold cv uh, essentially uh, you know does no shuffling of the data so it eliminates this step and so essentially we, we keep the order, the original order of the observations, but we, uh, in turn, we again split the data in equal size folds, but in turn, we leave one of them as testing and the other ones as uh, a training uh, set, okay? Now, a modified K-fold CV uh, tries to use the, or check the correlation between the samples and tries to eliminate from the training set 
observations which are found to be correlated with observations on the test set, okay? And then HV blocked C, uh, K fold CV, what it does is essentially uh, block CV, but it eliminates some, you know, uh, some uh, kind of chunks of data which are near time wise to the training set. Okay, so these are three of the most common seen variants of uh, cross validation for handling time series uh, models or for estimating the performance of time series models. Okay, now uh, changing to um, out of center approaches, the idea of these approaches is to respect order of the observation. So the time order of the time series is respected. And essentially we, we split the data in two parts. One, uh, a prior part, which is used for training, and then the subsequent part, which is used for, for testing the models or for you know, obtaining the estimates of their performance, okay? And so this is also known as hold out. And uh, you know, if we repeat this several times, we have this kind of you know, uh, uh, re re repeated or old out where uh, for time series, what we essentially do is the following. So we have you know, uh, observations from time one till time n. So we decide on a certain size for training the models and for testing. And then in the time window in between, we randomly draw some dates, okay? And for each uh, date that we randomly draw, we pick the previous train size window uh, observations. We train a model and evaluate the subsequent test window. And then we do that for you know, randomly selected dates. And for each of these models, we obtain an estimate and then we average and we get this you know, repeated old out estimate. Okay, so that's uh, uh, a procedure that always respects the time order of uh, the original data set. So it doesn't have the, the drawbacks that we have mentioned before, but it doesn't use the data so efficiently as cross validation because some of the observations are not never used for testing and the models. Okay. Now, uh, frequential approaches, on the other hand, uh, you know, use a different uh, uh, way of obtaining the estimates of the performance. So each observation is first used for testing a model and then for training. So it can be implemented in different ways. For instance, in the growing window approach, we start by training a model on a first chunk of data and then evaluate it on the subsequent chunk of data, okay? Mm -hmm. Then once we get the performance on this unseen data, on the second iteration, this is going to be part of the training set. So the training window grow, grows, okay? And then we evaluate it on the next chunk and so on and so forth, okay? So this can be done in a different way on, as a kind of sliding window where we, you know, we keep sliding the train and test. Or it can be done in a growing window, but leaving out some chunks in the mid between the training and the test kind of gap uh, to make sure that there is no, you know, correlation between the, the, the test and the training set. Okay, so these are, you know, three uh, variants of frequential approaches. Now, uh, in our uh, work, we uh, decided to compare these estimators, okay? So what we have essentially done is that given any time series, we have split this in two separate windows, okay? And then with this first window, uh, uh, we, uh, you know, build a model and use different estimation procedures to obtain an estimate of the performance of this model on unseen data, okay? So these are, for instance, cross validation, you know, frequential, out of sample, whatever. So different alternative methods are estimating the performance of N. And for each of them, we get a different estimate, okay? And then we apply this model on this unseen data and we measure its performance. And then we compare this true performance with estimates of each of these methods, okay? And so the quality of these estimation methods is going to be uh, so, you know, assessed by, you know, the absolute predictive accuracy error because, you know, uh, we compare the, the estimate with the true observed error or in case we want to uh, check not only the, the absolute difference, but also if there is under typical underestimation or, uh, 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 or other type of effect, then we, we remove the Okay, so that's the, the sort of that we have uh, a sort of procedure that we have used to compare these different estimators. And, and, you know, in terms of experiments, this is, of course, you know, a bit filled in this slide, but uh, just to give you an idea, we have uh, 
compare different types of uh, variants of cross-validation, different types of, uh, you know, old out, this out of sample, and different types of frequential. We have also tried different learning algorithms to obtain these M models, okay? Although we have generally observed that the results were very stable across the different learning algorithms. So I'm going to report for the sake of time, just the results on with one of them. And then we have, uh, in terms of time series data, we have considered, you know, uh, three synthetic time series, which were used on the previous studies by Bert Meyer. And then we have also collected 174 real world time series from different domains, uh, where, you know, statistical tests have, have indicated that 97 of them are stationary, while 77 are non stationary. Okay. And so the predictive tasks were the same for all the models, namely to forecast the next value of time series using an embed of the previous P uh, values, okay? And this, you know, the value of P was uh, determined using a, a method which is standard for this, okay? So um, basically, you know, on the synthetic, on the three synthetic time series, which were, you know, part of the original study, we have confirmed these results that CD approaches uh, particularly the blocked one outperform the out of sample. So a CV are the orange and this out of sample are this uh, kind of you know, bluish or greenish uh, light blue uh, box. Okay, so we have generally observed that cross validation outperform uh, the blue. So uh, although it was not part of the original study, we also included frequential approaches, which are this, you know, a purple bars and which you know we uh, our experiments shown that you know they also achieve very good results and in particular in one of the cases they were clearly the best okay but again we have confirmed on this synthetic time series that indeed cv approaches uh, uh, you know outperform out of sample approaches okay on this particular time series however when we move to real world time series uh, on stationary time series we confirmed again the same effect that you know blocked cross validation outperforms uh, um, repeated all out. Okay. However, on non stationary time series, we have observed that the repeated all out was uh, the best method in terms of estimation. And actually, you know, carrying out statistical significant tests, uh, we have observed that the probability or uh, that you know uh, uh, the the uh, repeated all out outperforms each of the other methods is much larger than the probability that it uh, it loses. So the lo the losses are this dark blue, and you know the probability of winning is this uh, light uh, green. Okay. So uh, um, in summary, what uh, uh, this study that we have carried out uh, leads us to think or to recommend is that for stationary time series, indeed using blocked k-fold CV is the best option, okay? However, for non-stationary time series, our recommendation is to use the repeated old out because that was, you know, uh, uh, where we obtained the best estimates, okay? Moreover, we have also observed that potential uh, uh, when applied in blocks is also uh, a good alternative and it is the best among the frequential alternatives, okay? And so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the results uh, were very similar across the different learning algorithms, okay? So if you want to know uh, more details and information, again, uh, this paper gives you the, uh, you know, the full details that I, I didn't have time to, to describe here. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are many more experiments that we did, okay? Now, uh, moving into the second question, uh, are there models or approaches that are clearly better than the others? So that leads us to, you know, to study benchmarks of time series forecasting models, okay? And again, I'm reporting some, some work that I've been doing with some colleagues on, uh, you know, exactly this sort of benchmarks, okay? Now, um, the motivation for uh, looking at this is that uh, machine learning models have witnessed, you know, noticeable su success in many, many predictive tasks. However, if we look at the forecasting literature, it's still dominated by statistical methods like Riemann uh, exponential smoothing. So our question was, well, why is that? So, um, one possible reason is that, in effect, there are several experimental studies like this one on a, a wildly, uh, you know. Uh, cited work on a uh, you know, very good journal, PLOS ONE, 
uh, has shown that you know these methods tend to outperform machine learning methods uh, on in forecasting univariate time series. Okay, and so we analyzed this study, this uh, benchmark, and uh, we we were kind of uh, you know. Uh, we were a bit skeptical on the conclusions because we have observed that you know um, the study uh, the study only included very small uh, time series, and so our working hypothesis was well maybe uh, if we increase the sample size, uh, there is something to uh, that can happen differently. Okay, and so our goal then was to, you know to to do an empirical analysis that kind of benchmarking of all these uh, modeling tools for time series, but uh, checking the impact of the size of the training data on the relative performance of different uh, uh, forecasting methods. And, uh, you know, following uh, the previous studies, we have, you know, divided the methods in uh, machine learning and statistical approaches. By the way, I completely disagree with this. Uh, um, you know, a grouping because I mean, machine learning models are also based on statistical principles. So, you know, it doesn't make sense for me, but, you know, trying to follow the same sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, grouping uh, used on previous studies, we, we, you know, we did the same. And uh, uh, then we considered, you know, 90 uh, univariate time series uh, from different domains. And, uh, you know, in terms of representatives of each of these groups, we used, you know, the representatives that, that were used on the previous benchmarks. And also uh, for machine learning uh, approaches, we've selected you know, a similar uh, representative groups. Okay. <clears throat> now, in terms of <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> in terms of methodological details of our comparisons, we you know, machine learning methods were applied to data sets uh, that were using an embed of the 10 previous values of the time series for forecasting the next one. While the statistical models were, um, uh, had this value of the, the size of the embed automatically determined by this R package forecast, which was also used on the, the previous study, okay? <clears throat> now, in terms of um, pre-processing of the data, we follow the same uh, strategy of these previous benchmarks, uh, you know, applying a series of, uh, you know, transformations uh, that were are essentially designed to 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 eliminate non stationaries from uh, from uh, the time series. Okay. Now, um, how have we tested for the impact of size? So um, we follow we try to follow as much as possible the previous benchmarks, and so uh, in this benchmark, the first eighteen observations were used to fit the models, and then these models were used to forecast either the next 18 in, in case of, you know, multi-step ahead comparisons or just the next in case of one step ahead, okay? Now, uh, to test the influence of size, we have used a kind of frequential approach where we were, you know, after we made this forecast, we then added this to the training set and then we continue in a kind of frequential way so that we obtain a kind of learning curve. So we see the, the performance of the models as the data set, as the training set grows, okay? kind of uh, what we usually name as a learning curve, okay? However, contrary to these uh, previous benchmarks uh, that consider uh, a time series with a maximum of 144 observations, in our case, uh, we, we use time series up to 1,000 of, you know, sorry, not up to, but with at least 1,000 observations, okay? To check exactly if, uh, you know, the conclusions would be different as we grow the training set size. <clears throat> so all models were evaluated with using the mean absolute scaled error and also by, uh, you know, performing a kind of ranking <clears throat> across uh, the models for each time series. Okay, so uh, in summary, the results for, you know, one step ahead forecasts were the following. So and in a red, you see the machine learning uh, representatives with the bold lines being a kind of averaging of their results. Here, uh, this vertical line is the size used in the previous benchmark, okay? And this, uh, you know, we went up till 1,000, okay? And this is the average rank of the procedures. So uh, because one of the methods, the statistical methods was very naive, which is this line here, we actually 
you know, repeated the plot, eliminating this, which because it would be pulling up the average because it's it's a very bad result. Okay, so maybe this is the 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 more correct graph to use. But still, nevertheless, what we observed is that we indeed confirm the conclusions of this previous uh, benchmark that indeed um, you know what were called what was called statistical methods clearly outperform machine learning methods okay uh, particularly on, you know on these initial sizes here okay however as we grow the size we observe an inversion of these conclusions okay and so indeed as we grow the training set use it for obtaining the models we observed an advantage of the machine learning So you know, while we confirm this, the results of this previous study, uh, indeed we observe that you know, if size the size of the training data is different, then that's not so clear. And actually, it's the opposite apparently. Now, uh, for multi-step ahead forecasts, the results are similar, although not so obvious. The advantage of machine learning methods. Okay. Uh, um, so you know, uh, similarly for small data sets, very clearly the standard statistical approaches are better. But as size uh, continues to grow, then that advantage uh, kind of disappears. Okay. Now, uh, so in summary, uh, what we uh, have concluded from these experiments is that you know indeed the size of the time series seems to be very important for the performance of machine learning models on time series forecasting. Okay. So machine learning models seems to tend to to need larger data sets to achieve their best performance. Okay. And uh, if we have a very small time series, then you know uh, clearly uh, they are not a good option, and you should should stick with you know more traditional approaches to time series forecasting. However, for larger time series, then you know uh, it may be worthwhile to consider these machine learning methods. And moreover, you know this difference may actually be larger than what we have uh, observed because you know. Recent models like deep neural networks that we have not included in our uh, study because they require typically very large data sets. But if indeed we have very large data sets, then uh, these models tend to be a really, you know, they, they tend to excel in terms of performance. So the difference may be even larger if we consider these models, provided that we have, you know, extremely large data sets. Okay. All right. So time to, to move into the third question. So uh, given this observed diversity in uh, different settings and different modeling approaches, so are ensembles a good answer to face uh, this diversity? Okay, and so what I'm going to talk a bit now is you know ensemble approaches for time series forecasting, and I'm going to base this uh, presentation, this part of the presentation again on uh, two uh, previous works with uh, some of my uh, collaborators. Okay. Now, uh, the motivation for ensembles is, you know, uh, as I mentioned, you know, uh, different models uh, obtain different results on different problems, okay? And with the non-stationary time series, uh, you know, that are very frequent in the real world, you know, uh, we observe, uh, you know, a very uh, large diversity of performance because of the assumptions that the model, the different assumptions that the different models have, okay? Now, ensembles are formed by sets of models. So instead of having a single model, we have sets of models that are used together to somehow uh, solve a problem. And so they are known as a, a very fun way of uh, fighting complexity by injecting diversity on the solution. So our hypothesis then was, you know, maybe ensembles are a good way with coping with this diversity that we uh, find on uh, real world time series okay so that's you know that was kind of motivation for for this uh, approach for trying ensembles on time series forecasting so the basics of ensembles uh, you know uh, are somehow shown on this picture so we are given a data set with this data set we build several base learners and so once we have uh, to make a forecast we ask each of these base learners what is their prediction and their predictions are somehow aggregated into a final prediction so that's you know in a nutshell what ensembles do so there are some key steps here first of all you know how to generate these base learners to make them different because if they are the same technique if they use the same data then the model will be the same so how to generate this and here the the key 
to make ensemble successful are you know, diversity, you know, generate a diverse set of base models. And then the second important question is how to aggregate the different opinions of these different models when we are forecasting. Okay, and so uh, right now I'm going to talk a bit about you know, possible answers to these two uh, crucial steps. Okay, so concerning generating diversity among base learners, so frequent methods of generating diversity is for instance, varying the training data. So each of these models will be uh, obtained in random permutations or random samples of this training data. And so they will use different training sets and so they will uh, learn different models, okay? Sometimes we also uh, uh, inject diversity by having the different base learners using different uh, views of the data or if you prefer different sets of variables, okay? Now, uh, in a work uh, that we have done before, we uh, tried exactly that idea. So we picked bagging, which is one of the most well-known ensemble approaches that essentially picks a training data, generates random bootstrap samples of this training data, and then applies the same learning algorithm to each of these uh, bootstrap samples. Okay, so that's bagging. So the diversity here is on the training sets, which are random bootstrap samples, okay? Are bootstrap samples of the original data. Now, what we have done is, well, we try to complement this as with you know, different ways of handling diverse dynamic regimes of the time series and also different ways of handling non-stationary. So how have we done so? So the, the baseline is a normal bagging where you know, all of the models use bootstrap samples of the data, but this data uses the same variables which will be an embed with a certain size. That is, you know, forecast T plus one using, let's say, P or K max, if you want, uh, previous values, okay? And so no extra variables were added. So that's a normal bagging, okay, that we will name E. Then on top of that, we try to see if, you know, uh, on top of these uh, uh, pr predictors that uh, uh, contain the previous observations, we also add new variables that try to capture some potential non-stationarities on the data, namely by calculating, you know, uh, kind of moving averages and moving standard deviation or moving variance uh, uh, across the data. Okay, so we kind of enrich the data set with some variables that this capture some properties of the, uh, of the data in recent time steps, okay? And these properties were basically, you know, uh, the average and the variance, okay? So then we also tried to have, you know, the uh, one third of the models use, you know, all the predictors, another third use using only half of the predictors. So instead of using, let's say the 10 previous steps, only using the five previous steps, and then another third using, you know, uh, one fourth of the predictors and without extra variables. And so we try all these combinations, essentially a varying, you know, uh, the variables or the predictors that were provided to each of the models, okay? So in a way, we are varying the training data by the normal way of bagging, by bootstrap samples, but we are also varying the variables by, uh, you know, having each model consider different types of predictors, always with the goal of forecasting the next step of the time series. So, uh, you know, our hypothesis, of course, was that, you know, these new forms of generating ensembles with, you know, uh, diversity, which is really the property of time series, could, you know, outperform a normal ensemble, the bagging, and also be, at the same time, be competitive with, you know, state-of-the-art standard uh, forecasting methods, and we have tried uh, RIMA as a representative. So we have compared these alternatives across 14 real-world time series, uh, the performance was measured, you know, by means where there are over 10 repetitions of old doubt, one of the, you know, the methods that we have studied. And we have tried, you know, several variants in terms of the number of base models of the ensemble and also the size of the embed that was considered. So on this initial study, we have considered, you know, 1,020 models, base models in the ensemble or 1,500. And then in terms of uh, the size of the embed, we have considered 20 and 30, okay? Now, uh, what we have observed for these types of, you know, uh, models is that generally, you know, uh, the variance with more 
diversity in terms of the, 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 the numbers of predictors achieve the best uh, uh, ranking, which is, you know, ranking the, the lower, the better, okay? So, uh, you know, these initial results confirm that it is indeed useful to inject diversity that takes into account some properties of the time series uh, to improve uh, the performance of these uh, ensembles and making them uh, competitive uh, against, you know, standard forecasting tools, okay? Now, um, the second uh, study uh, considered the other part, which is, well, we have a set of base models how should we uh, aggregate the predictions of these main models, okay? So uh, the simplest way is simply averaging their predictions, okay? Now, uh, more sophisticated uh, aggregation methods uh, track the recent performance of the base models and use this recent performance as a way of dynamically, uh, dynamically awaiting, awaiting this combination, okay? So, models that recently achieved very good performance are given more weight on this average, okay? So that's the, the, the basic idea. Now, meta-learning has also been used, uh, for instance, in stacking uh, to kind of learn the, the interdependencies among the base learners, and, uh, you know, dynamically decide the form of better aggregating them. Now, um, what we have tried uh, uh, in this work was to use a kind of meta-learning to learn the individual capabilities of each model. So uh, we kind of learned the error profile of each base learner, okay? And so uh, uh, this kind of meta model specializes in anticipating the error of each base model. And then we use these uh, results uh, to try to, uh, you know, uh, influence the averaging process. So let's see how. The idea is that uh, uh, you know, given a data set, we obtain a series of base models, okay? Each of these base models, of course, given a, a, a test case, will make predictions. But at the same time, we maintain an equally sized uh, set of meta models. Each of these meta models specializing, uh, specializes in learning how this model behaves. So this Z1 is good at estimating the error of M1. Okay, so given a test case, each of these models makes a forecast of the target variable, and each of them makes a forecast of the error of this model. Okay, so these models are trained to forecast the time series. These Zs are trained to forecast the error of these models. Okay, so now uh, giving these estimates of the error of these models, we kind of scale them to create some first that are uh, some, sorry, some weights that are going to be used in the aggregation of the opinion of these models, okay? So we are using these meta, meta models to uh, estimate the error of each of the components of the ensemble, okay? So that's generally the idea. There are a few more things here in play. So uh, uh, we have diversity in this algorithm uh, in two ways, implicitly by using different learning algorithms for the base learner. So each of these models are going to be different. They will use different learning algorithms, okay? So that's an implicit way of creating diversity. And then we have also explicit diversity because during the aggregation, we take into account not only these predicted errors that you see here, but also the correlation between the models calculated over a recent window. So what we do is that uh, we try to influence or rescale the ways so that we don't include in the averaging models that we observe that to be very uh, strongly correlated to each other because that's just reinforcing the same opinion and so we want to make sure that we have diversity and so we penalize models that you know are highly correlated with others in terms of what they tend to predict okay so we have these two types of uh, uh, um, diversity implicit and explicit so how does this algorithm makes prediction so when we are asked to make the prediction for the next time step of a time series, so the models are asked for their predictions as we have seen here on this figure. Uh, the, the meta models are asked for their estimate of the error of each of these models, okay? Then a committee of a, only a certain percentage of all the models, which basically is determined by observing the lowest error in a recent time window. So we observe the, the 
performance of all the models in a recent time window, and we select the top k percent best models currently, which may change across the time. Okay, and then the weights of this uh, percentage of models are determined, you know, as a function of the estimated errors in a, in a scaling process. But then these weights are kind of uh, adjusted to penalize models that are strongly correlated with each other. Okay, so we basically pick, uh, start with, you know, we, we perform a kind of ranking. We include the opinion of the best model according to this, sorry, according to this weight. And then in principle, we would add the opinion of the second model. But if the second best model is strongly correlated with the first one, then we downgrade its weight. So it's, it's going to go down on this ranking, okay? So that's more or less the idea of using correlation to readjust these weights. And then finally, you, you know, we just average uh, um, the opinion of these K percentage models according to these readjusted weights, okay? Now, uh, some results, and we are running out of time, so I, I'm, I'm finishing. I, I want to leave some time for questions. So um, generally, we have observed, you know, uh, on a very large benchmark of uh, data sets that I don't have time to describe here, but you can find on the paper that, uh, you know, ADE uh, beats most of the, the methods with, uh, you know, uh, statistical significance, okay? And so, uh, you know, uh, we were uh, kind of happy with uh, the outcome of uh, this method and uh, somehow uh, shows that, you know, experimentally, of course, that uh, uh, it is indeed a, a, a very good way of uh, forecasting a, a wide range of time series that was used on this, on this study, okay? All right, so uh, wrapping up, so concluding remarks. So uh, I've tried to show you that, uh, you know, model evaluation is a key step for comparing, selecting, and tuning forecasting models. And that you know, time series data raises some challenges to you know, standard uh, performance estimation methods that we should take into account when deciding which method to use to estimate the performance of our candidate models, okay? Now, uh, we have also talked about the fact that you know, different models have different characteristics and you know, advantages and disadvantages, and that you know, um, benchmarks should consider all aspects and characteristics of the models. And in particular for machine learning models, we have observed that it is you know, important that we include in benchmarks uh, large time series because they seem to be uh, requiring uh, you know, significantly more data than uh, classical uh, forecasting approaches to achieve you know, uh, uh, good results, okay? And finally, uh, I try to convince you that ensembles are interesting approaches to cope with this diversity of uh, regimes and non-stationarities that we observe on real world time series. And that, you know, ADE is indeed very competitive uh, ensemble um, that, you know, incorporates several ways of uh, uh, injecting diversity and, uh, you know, achieving very good results. And by the way, uh, if you want to try this, this is uh, freely available as an R package that if you contact me, I can uh, show you um, the link to, to download it and install it, okay? Now, um, some open challenges that I didn't have time to, to, to talk about, you know, and that we continue to work are things like automatic forecasting. So uh, uh, our ideal mo model would be something completely automatically. So we, we just throw it at any time series and it will be able to somehow um, automatically adjust several components of our self, for instance, the sets of models that are considered, the sets of features or predictors, you know, um, several settings of ADE that could somehow be done automatically without asking the intervention of the end user, okay? Then some of the ideas that we have discussed are of course being extended in our group to other types of data dependencies, not only time dependencies like time series, but also spatial, spatial temporal, network data. So all of these type of uh, problems or data sets also have this sort of dependencies. And so they raise the same questions like uh, I've talked about uh, uh, concerning time series. And then, you know, there are other interesting problems related with time series like hierarchies of time series or even activity monitoring uh, where we try to uh, transform forecast into actions. Let's say for instance, on an intensive care unit where we have all these time series monitoring the health of patients 
And of course, we want to forecast of the evolution of this uh, important data, but to also want to make decisions based on this forecast. Okay, and so that's also a very interesting. All right, so uh, sorry for the time. So I want to leave some time for questions. And so uh, thank you for your attention. There are here some acknowledgements that are due to my particular, you know, to all my group, particularly to Vitor and Mariana, because they actively participated on this and also to, to my funding agencies. So thank you.